Pittsburgh Steeler fans, welcome back to another episode of the Steelers Preview. I am Jeff Hartman, editor of BehindTheSteelCurtain.com, and with me, just one person right now. That's Mr. David Schofield, deputy editor. David, deputy Dave, deputy Dave. That kind of sounds, I like that. Deputy Dave, what's going sounds, on? Sounds you? like dippity dog. I don't know. <laughs> but, uh, I'm, what's I'm, up? Doing, I'm doing good. Hey, have you been... Uh, you, have, have you turned tuned into NFL Network to watch one no. second of the combat? Yeah, neither of no, them. No, um, I've been getting kids to bed. I've been trying to prepare for the show. I have not. Mm -hmm. um, I had. I did see that. You know, right now I'm behind the steel curtain dot com. The the open thread uh, is has a lot of comments. That's great. I'm glad the people are tuning in to both the combine and behind the steel curtain dot com to talk about it amongst the community members. So that's really cool. And we'll do an open thread for every day of the uh combine so tomorrow night saturday night check it out behind the steel curtain.com should be your one-stop shop for all your pittsburgh Steelers needs. you might be wondering where brian anthony davis is I, he tubing or something he might he he's supposed yes. to join us late um we'll see when he gets here but we are going to press on the schedule is not going to change we will have an after party we will still do our steelers preview today we're going to preview the wide receiver position we were going to do that last week but because of the free agent talk got a little out of hand, we pushed it back to this week. So that's not what we're going to start off with, though. We're not going to start off with the wide receivers. We want to start off with the Steelers offseason plan. And I, I think that if you ask most Steeler fans heading into this offseason, what's the plan? And th they would give you the, well, there's not a lot of cap room. You know, what are you going to do with Bud Dupree? Who knows about Ben Roethlisberger? I think you would say the majority of fans would say that, right, Dave? Yeah. Okay. The plan's changing. Yeah. And it's changing and it's evolving in front of our very eyes for a lot of reasons that we want to talk about. First being Ben Roethlisberger, at least from the peanut gallery, and peanut gallery meaning the fan base seeing what they're privy to, which is one pass of a football. It looks like he's back. Kevin Colbert at the combine says that he thinks that he's going to be back and maybe better than ever. That might be some smoke being blown, but still that's what he said. Um, and so that changes things. And how, in your opinion, Dave, how does that change the Steelers off season plans? I don't know that it changes them drastically because I still don't think that the Steelers were going to be in the market. Some people wanted them to get a more reliable backup quarterback. I'm like, they're spending too much money on that position already with Ben Roethlisberger. They've got to roll with what they have. And you just hope, hope that it's Ben. And if not, then it's another year of what we had, but I, I you still want to keep this defense intact because I don't think it's going to change too much what they're doing as much as it is, excitement of how far they can go with what they have. If you know what I mean, does that make sense from a defensive standpoint? I agree mm -hmm. from an offensive standpoint. I think it changes a lot because let, let's be honest. If you're looking at the draft and in, in, in let's say Ben Roethlisberger has not been cleared to even throw yet, or he's only able to throw like a, a tennis ball, light tennis ball, like barely just getting that motion down. The Steelers might have some, might be hesitant in terms of who they draft and how they draft, in my opinion. And it's just my opinion. Everyone's entitled to their own. I could say, you mean, you mean offensively? Yeah. Cause I think right well, now they, they have to say, be kind of, they got to be jacked up and they got to yeah. think we, we need some playmakers now. Well, let's just say this. I think whether Ben was healthy or Ben wasn't, offensive line was going to be an important there. You know, you know, because yeah, no, even I if it's somebody else, you need a better offensive line. Even if Absolutely. it's Ben, you want to, you know, it, it's they, they need to recycle. They need to get more guys coming in and doing their thing with the offensive line. I think where it makes the biggest difference is tight end and receiver and how you want to address that. I think it's going to make a difference. I mean, he's technically still counting on the salary cap and everything. Vance McDonald's a big question because they have to decide here in the next couple of weeks, are they going to exercise their club option for him for this year? I think Ben Roethlisberger, I, I still don't know which way they're going to go with it, but that definitely comes into play with what they're thinking than what they're going to do in the draft at that position. I mean, to me, with the w young wide receivers they have, if, they're, if it looked like they didn't know if they were going to have Ben – I almost think it would have been a waste to to go wide receiver 
in the draft. But now with Ben, you're like, well, if we can, if the right weapons there at the right spot, then pull the trigger on it and, you know, get them everything you can. Yeah, exactly. And so uh, let's not also forget Vance McDonald is really good friends with Ben Roethlisberger. They're very tight. Yeah. Those two Um, Bible study. They hang out. Their wives are friends. We say it all the time. Ben controls a lot about the roster. And when we saw him at the West Virginia basketball game with Ryan Switzer, what did I say? Ryan Switzer will be on the team next year. (laughs) (laughs) Just because that's, I I guess it's the way it goes. But um, I think offensive line is obviously going to be paramount no matter what. But now with Ben looking like he could be back, the Steelers are saying all the right things. Not that we would ever expect them to not say the right things. Like you said, tight end, wide receiver. How do they address that? Do they trust themselves to get a an offensive lineman like a BJ Finney, like a Matt Filer, like a Kelvin Beecham, someone that they think has a ton of upside in the back end of the draft? I'm not so sure because those guys, although they've drafted a lot of them, and I, just, I didn't name all of them that they've had play for them, even a guy like Chris Hubbard or Alejandro Villanueva, and there's been some that haven't panned out too. You know, so let's not forget that. And and let's also not forget that nothing is a guarantee in the draft, and regardless of whether it's first, second, third, or seventh. You know, look at Mike Adams, a second round draft pick. Yeah. That didn't pan out. So we all can sit here and wax poetic about what position they should or shouldn't draft or just specific prospects and, and things like that. And and that's the hot button take right now because the, the scouting combine's going on and everyone just falls in love with these numbers whether it's a bench press number, a 40 yard dash number, uh, everyone is, is enamored with it. And there's a reason why the NFL put it in prime time, but at the same time, there's so much more to it, but we'll talk about the combine in a second. There's another factor that could change the Steelers off season plans. And it's actually a very large factor. And there's a lot of facets to this. And a lot of mainstream media are not focusing on all of them. And that would be the collective bargaining agreement between the NFL and the NFLPA which in case you haven't been paying attention has now gone to vote by the players. All they need is majority vote. That's it. Just a majority vote. It's gone through all the facets, every, the the player reps, all that stuff, just a majority. Now players don't have to vote. They should exercise their right to vote, but they don't have to. So the lawyers, everything I heard on the radio today was that the NFL lawyers and the NFL PA lawyers are going to fast track this over the weekend Get it out to the players, hopefully, by the end of the weekend so that next week we should know one way or the other. But this can impact a lot, Dave. Go ahead and explain that a little bit. Yeah, what it impacts a lot right now is that today started the the period for, what is it? it it's a two-week period, I'm pretty sure, um, of designated the franchise or transition tags on players. Mm-hmm. Now, I didn't hear any, I, I I wasn't looking at other teams, but I haven't heard anything of teams using the tag yet. Just think, rumor, just rumors. Yeah, like there was nothing rumor official. The Chiefs are going to use it, but nothing official. Yeah, and the reason that teams, especially teams like the Steelers, are going to wait is if they can. They're still operating under the final year of the CBA. Uh, the lawyers met to see if they could change anything before this started, because the players are voting. But I think if they got a feel that it was definitely going to get passed, they might have done some stuff, but that's still kind of up in the air. Um, It's not as as cut and dry as it could be. So right now, teams can use both a franchise and transition tag. That's one thing. The other thing is kind of like the boat that the Steelers are in. Right now, pretty much because of the 30% rule with restructuring contracts or any new contracts, teams' only option to, to save cap money is to release guys. Because now you look at like the Steelers, if they wanted to use the franchise tag on either Bud Dupree or Javon Hargrave, that they don't have the room to do it. So they would have to cut players. But if there's a new CBA and they could say, oh, well, we could maybe restructure something, then they might not have to release someone that they are are not sure what they want to do with. Um, so it, it a lot of that comes comes into play and in, in how they have to figure stuff out. So getting a new CBA would allow the Steelers franchise to conduct business as usual much more than what they have to do right now. Right. And, that, and you know, that's something that you know Dennis in the live chat said, no one's fretting over the CBA. It's business as usual. Yes, it is. But in terms of making these key decisions, which can have a ripple effect on your roster, it does matter. 
It does yeah. matter. Well, and, and I, I shouldn't, you know, sometimes I try to stay off the comments on social media, you know, whether it be Facebook or Twitter or whatnot, but I, because so many people would just say things that aren't and really informed. They're like, oh, the Steelers, they just, you know, push some money down the road and restructure a few contracts. You can't do it this year. You can't right. do it. The only person you could really restructure to get any kind of money is Ben Roethlisberger. And I was, I did the math and, and can, and confirmed it with a couple other sources. I got a number of 3.2 million out of Ben's 33 and a half million. The only thing they can push around to save this year of that would be 3.2 million. That's really all that's available in restructures right now under the under the current deal. Cam Hayward's going into the last year of his deal. It would be great to get him another deal, especially one that's most of the time when guys sign a new deal, the first year is very low on the cap yeah. because most of it's signing bonus. He's a he's he needs a new deal. They can't get rid of Cam. Cam's the man. Yeah. yeah. But they but right now they're so handcuffed with this 30% rule, getting him a deal now isn't going to help anything. So that's the thing. There, there's just there's a lot of business that the Steelers usually do stuff that they can't do. Yeah, and then Dennis responded to my comment and said, "What matters, Jeff, is that we ain't got no money. No, not right now, but they could. They could. Yeah, they could if free they up free money. Free up money. Yeah, they could free up they, some money. And the Steelers have done that for years, but right now they're handcuffed. So we'll see. You know, we'll see what happens yeah. with the collective bargaining agreement. And I don't want to get well. We might as well. It. Uh, I think it was Snowman earlier in the live chat. Yes, he said the players have been complaining about the CBA. Okay. Let's rephrase that. Can I can I go Let, now? Hold on. Let's rephrase <laughs> that with not all players. The the players that are the upper echelon have been complaining. You, you're talking about your top couple of percent of players. Right. Your vast majority of players in the National Football League, I guarantee you are not complaining. They're seeing this as 17 games, another game check. A bump up from the veteran minimum, that's more money. They're seeing better benefits. They like it. Everything they well, even even goes down to, and, and again, unless you've read some of these documents, which we've posted on BehindTheSteelCurtain.com, it even goes down to that the NFL is including tuition reimbursement. If you want to go back to school and get your degree, they're going to pay for classes. That's not being discussed, but that's part of this collective bargaining agreement. And no one's talking about it. All they're hearing are J.J. Watt, Russell Wilson, Richard Sherman, Marquise Pouncey, of all people, yeah. just spouting off endlessly about hate it. James Harrison's chiming in. James Harrison, you're retired. Why do you care? <laughs> this is going to help you, James Harrison. <laughs> yeah, the you're, retired you're adding stuff for, for retired players. All right. Are, are, are you ahead. ready for me to rant? Ahead, are you ready for me to go? Okay. First of all, I'm going to try to stay calm. If any of you out there really want to know, there are two members of the Pittsburgh Steelers you need to be paying attention to and what they say. And those members are Ramon Foster and Cam Hayward. Ramon Foster is the player rep for the Steelers. Cam yeah. Hayward is the alternate player rep. So some people are like, oh, what happens if the Steelers cut Foster? It's Cam Hayward. Okay. Yeah. Both of these guys, and I have an article coming out tomorrow. I think you told me to schedule it for 8.45 a.m. about it's very interesting. They, they didn't say how the Steelers voted, but if you want to look at how both of those players have reacted to other things, because obviously I, I'm, I'm sure they communicated with what they needed to do. You could, you could draw the conclusion that it's pretty obvious that they voted for this proposal. And for example, the thing that's frustrating about all these players and some of the media people, and even some of the Pittsburgh media people, one in particular, keep saying stuff on Twitter about, about this awful, terrible CBA. I'm like, Will you please explain what's terrible about it? You can sit back and say it's awful. Tell me why. And that's what's happening with all these players, too. They're saying, like, Pouncey, all I heard was F-bombs and S-bombs and everything else, but still nothing about why it's so terrible, especially not respecting the negotiating process. And that's the biggest thing that Foster's about. Respect the process that we've gone through. The only person that really offered anything as to why was Aaron Rodgers, who said that he felt that that there wasn't a great an, enough reduction of off-season voluntary workouts. And do you know who stepped up? He didn't address him directly, but made tweets about it. Was Cam Hayward? He's like, yeah. Why are people complaining about about having too many voluntary workouts? If it's bad for your body, guess what? It's voluntary. Don't do it. Yeah. 
you know, don't complain about how many voluntary workouts there are when they're voluntary. I mean, if they took the word voluntary off, I'd understand. They went back when they fought with the owners. I don't know, saw fought with, I shouldn't say fought with. When they met with the owners this week, earlier this week on Tuesday, they took out the cap of the number that they had for how much players would be paid for a 17th game once they implemented it, if they or were working on a c- contract that was signed before the CBA. They took it out. So now everyone, no matter how much you make, they had a 17th game, you get a 17th paycheck based on what your salary is. So if you look at both sides, the owners want three things from what I understand. Now there's probably a lot more into this, but the NFLPA isn't releasing this other stuff. And of course the NFL is going to release all the stuff that makes them look good. If you want to go back, I had an article this afternoon, 56 bullet points of what the players are getting. 56. This is players. This is former players, everything, all these things in for, in, for the players. The main three things that the, that the, that the owners want is they want the 17th game. They want an extra team in the playoffs from each conference and they want the deal this year. Those are the three things they want. And they want it this year because they want to redo their TV deals, even though they're not up yet. And what people don't understand is why they want to redo the TV deals. Now we're not going to get a big discussion about this, but right now the economy is good but there's an election in November and they want it done now with the TV stuff to lock in their deals with them. That's why they want it now. Those are the three things they want. The players are getting 56 other things in return. If you take away one of those three, take away a third of what you're getting from, for the players. If, if the players don't want to do it this year, they're going to, they're going to get a deal. That's nowhere close to this next year. Nowhere close to this next year to start off. They don't want the 17th game. You're basically taking what the owners want. And it's it's not, I don't even think the owners want the 17th game. The TV companies want the 17th game and the owners want to work out the best deal with them. I'm a season ticket holder. I don't even want a 17th game. I don't, but I understand that, that that's where the money comes from. And I know I'm sitting here ranting and Jeff's just waiting to say something, but um, you're, you catch up with the live chat and, and let me know how bad people are, are busting me on this. So, bad. but not too bad. <laughs> but so that's what's really going on. And I mean, they've been working on this deal for 10 months. And the personally, I think I couldn't believe the, the owners were giving the players this much. And there are some people that are really on the 50%, 50% to up, to up that revenue as much as they are. It's almost like a stepping stone to where they're going to get to 50%, probably the next deal after this one. So that's the issue. But the reason I think this deal is going to pass is is almost 60% of the league plays is playing on either a rookie contract or league or a league minimum contract. And those are both being raised by like 20% next year, not even adding a 17th game. Just imagine, just imagine if you were worked, Jeff is a teacher. Just imagine that they went out and they got a 20% raise for the teachers but people were against it because the principals are screaming who are already making a bunch more money than the teachers that it's not good enough for them. That's kind of what's going on here because it's the guys that are, that are making the big money. They're not going to see a big step in, 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 they're not seeing a big step in salary, but all these other guys that, that really go out and don't have much time in, in the league, they're the ones that are going out and they're going to benefit from this. And and unless the, the vocal majority, or sorry, the vocal minority is drowning them out it's and convincing them otherwise, I'm afraid that, like Marquis Pouncey says, this is a bad deal for everybody else coming out here. Uh, you guys need to trust us. This is, he's talking to guys that are going to be on his path. How many guys are in the NFL and they don't see a second contract? A lot. The majority of them. <laughs> more guys don't see a second contract than what do. So don't say that you need to listen to me because you need to look out for what's going to happen when you get to my shoes, because most of them are never going to get there. So why not look out for those guys for the time that they're here? Well, look, the one thing too, is that this has been negotiated, like you said, for 10 months, this is not new. And if Marquis Pouncey is so adamant about his hatred for it, for it, 
did he speak up to Ramon Foster? Did he talk to Cam Hayward and really voice his displeasure with what was going on? Or is this all breaking news to him? Because it seems like for a lot of players, yeah. this isn't new. Now, the one thing, and, and I, honestly, I'm not siding with either because I just want football. Just like yeah. probably 99.9% yeah, of people in the live chat right now, they just want football. Because honestly, this is a business for us. Behind the steel curtain.com is a business. It's our business. This podcast podcast platform is our business. And if we don't have football, it's not the off season. A lockout is a lockout. And I've been through one of those already and it sucks. You can't talk about anything because there's nothing ahead, at least in the foreseeable future. But there's a lot of things that are minutia in this deal that aren't talked about that I love. I love the fact that they're going to expand rosters, that they're going to have a third person that can come off injured reserve, that the practice squad is going to gain two more players. These are all really good things that a lot of us have said for years that they should be doing. Oh my gosh, expand the game day roster. Yes, do it. And they're doing it. So yeah, 17 games will be weird. I'm sure they said the same thing when they went to 16. Would it would it be nice to have, well, it, for one, it wouldn't have mattered for Fred Johnson. Would it be nice if the Steelers still had Patrick Morris right now, who they moved up when Pouncey was suspended and then lost him to waivers to the Broncos? Guess what? Now a player can be moved up from the practice squad to the to the active roster two times and not be exposed to waivers. Yeah. I mean, there's that's a, there's a lot, there's of, a lot this... of good things, mm -hmm. but I don't know how much, you know, that's just better for the game, but I don't know how much there people hear only what the mainstream media says. And what are they saying? Yes. 17 games, 17th game with cap and all that stuff. And three preseason games. That's all they hear. But with that, we bring in mm -hmm. Brian Anthony Davis, who's back from the ski slope. He's the, the, the <laughs> ski bunny is back. Ski um, bunny. <laughs> how's it going there, Brian? How are you? I'm doing great fellas. I'm, doing awesome thanks for uh waiting on me and uh your patience but i'm here and i'm sure that uh, lots of nice things were said about me in my absence so that would make me feel good we just said you were shredding the mountain out there <laughs> shredding the mountain it was actually tubing but um yeah, you know guys same. this is after party stuff but i don't go on skis after a ski instructor looked at me and said for god's sakes man just get down <laughs> <laughs> you're going so, to die oh well. <laughs> We've all been there at one point in our lives, I think. So let's go into the kind of wraps up our headline, which was the, the Steelers offseason plan is changing and it's going to change, but it's not just the Steelers. It's really any team, the Steelers specifically because of Ben Roethlisberger coming back because of the Steelers confidence in him coming back. It's going to change some things. So stay tuned. Ben Roethlisberger still has some stuff going on. He still has, I think he's he's probably back in Pittsburgh by now. He had a couple other sessions out in California. Then he's coming back to Pittsburgh. He's not going to be cleared until probably around OTAs. We're talking May, June-ish. And then he'll be good to go by the end of July when they report to training camp. So exciting stuff for the Steelers. Exciting stuff. Let's get um, into – go ahead, uh, Dave. Go ahead. I just, can I address one thing that was, that was brought up in the live chat? I'm going to bring it up sure. here. Yeah. That it said that all 53, or if they get the new CBA, 55 players should be active on Sunday's games. I'm adamant against that. And that is because they have that in there for competitive balance one, because a team who has a lot of injuries versus a team that has no injuries, the team with no injuries automatically just has more personnel. Now, once you get more than seven injuries that you're dealing with that, sorry, that you're just going to have to do that. But I think that's bad for the players because let's say you have a, a rookie contract guy or, you know, who was an undrafted free agent or a sixth round pick or something like that that's trying to stick around that isn't a hundred percent. If you're going to dress all these guys, then he's going to dress and maybe go out there and hurt his career. But if he's a guy that you're like, you know, you're not a hundred percent, we got to rest seven, we got to sit seven guys anyway. So we're going to give you this, this week off. That's better for that player. So it makes it more balanced competitively. I think Brian disagrees on this one. If I, if I recall um, his thinking on it, I, I might be off there, but that's something that I feel now, if they want to change the number, I understand, but uh, that's the whole reason it's in there. So one team who's dealing with, with injuries and, and it, it keeps them from having to put guys on IR that they wouldn't have to otherwise, because they could just have them inact on their inactive list for a few weeks. You know, Dave, the only thing that, that I would like to see them do on that, 
I get what you're saying, and I'm, I'm not really going to poo-poo that at all. I mean, I don't think what yeah. you're saying is off base. The only thing that I want to see them do is just say, look, you have an extra slot. You have a 50, uh, you have an extra slot for a third quarterback. And mm -hmm. just everybody, because they used to do the old emergency quarterback I thing. remember that, yeah. Um, but, you know, just look, we're not going to penalize you. Everybody has... If you want to take advantage of that extra spot and put a quarterback in there, you're allowed to and not get penalized. Yeah. Because, I mean, really, we, we saw a couple guys go down in the same game. And wasn't the rule with that back in the day that that quarterback, if he came in before the fourth quarter, he had to be the only quarterback that played? The other two couldn't come back in? I remember that rule. That, that was yeah, cool. I, crazy I, like that. Yeah, it's uh, there were exact rules, and I can't even remember the time period. I know it was like late nineties, maybe. Yeah. Um, but you really you can't go with just two quarterbacks on a game day roster. Yeah, it's just I mean it's disastrous. It's kind of like the NHL's emergency goalie um, rule, Damn which is driver, in, and now they're trying to get rid of it. Which has been in place forever. And if you follow hockey, you've seen situations. This isn't the first time that it happened. Um, it's rare, but it's part of the game. And I, I know I listened to some sports talk radio this week, and they said that in the NFL, they should have emergency kickers. That if a kicker mm -hmm. goes down, they have someone that maybe has soccer experience, or maybe it was a D1 kicker but never got drafted or isn't in the XFL, and they, you know, they can go out and kick for your team. So I, I don't know. I, I think it's wow. crazy. It's crazy. Wasn't but, it, um, wasn't it Jean-Claude Van Damme that made the, uh, an amazing um, save death? In, in, in game seven of the Stanley cup finals? <laughs> who, who were the penguins <laughs> playing in that? Brian knows Dave, do you know, in that movie, oh, it's yeah, actually um, a recreation of an actual oh, cup final. Yeah. Cause it was, um, Oh, I, I thought it was the Los Angeles Kings. I guess it's not. No, I don't think it was the Kings. Yeah, Cause it was, yeah. um, Shoot, oh, my the, the minor so league hockey team that I grew up watching, the Wheeling Thunderbirds, actually played the opposite team of the Penguins in the movie Sudden Death. Oh, really? They did. Really? So yeah. They filled in and had to wear their jerseys. It was um because mm -hmm. it was it was filmed in Pittsburgh. In the was it the Blackhawks or the Stars? Was. Was the Black Black I was gonna say, was it the ninety? Was it ninety two or ninety? It was Penguins Blackhawks Cup Final, mm -hmm. and Jean Claude Van Damme <laughs> comes in and saves the day. You know, in you know more ways funny. than one. If, if I I know it's not the after party, but if I could say something real quick about an emergency goalie, back in the uh, in the late eighties, nineties, the Johnstown Chiefs had to bring in their trainer to be the emergency goalie. Yeah, and that emergency goalie was a uh, a Johnstown. He played for Westmont High School. A uh, Johnstown uh, kid that got to come in and got the win. His name's Dana Heinze. And the reason you know that He's name now the equipment manager yes. of the penguins, uh, his, uh, his mom and dad were uh, teachers of mine, just a wonderful family. And, uh, but I remember him coming in and like hometown boy gets to play in a uh, minor league hockey game as the emergency goalie. Cause they were just out of people. And the coach at the time was, uh, one of the Hanson brothers. Steve Carlson. <laughs> All right, quick. Bob. It, it, oh, sorry. <laughs> I mean, to, to give people a taste of the uh, the after party, uh, I like to do this because our after party numbers are not the same. They're not the equivalent of the preview. So to give you a little taste, guys, is there any better Jean-Claude Van Damme movie than Bloodsport? <laughs> I don't think so. Bloodsport was the best. Yeah. I'm trying to think of a time um, cop. <laughs> Lionheart? <laughs> What no. <laughs> Lionheart? I never even saw that one. No, oh, it's a lot like Bloodsport. <laughs> yeah, well, Jean Claude Van Damme had a very honestly. I, I I liked the, oh, what was the one where he was the Cajun guy and they were in the Mardi Gras warehouse? Um, Hard Target. I liked that one. <laughs> I mean, yeah. now we're we're getting an after party <laughs> stuff because I'm about to say yeah. who right. were Gene Clude Clam Dam, or uh, I had a buddy that called him that. Um, All right. his name was Gene Clude or uh, Steven Seagal. Cyborg. Steven Seagal, good lord. Okay, all right, let's um, get back. To <laughs> so that's a save it for the after just, party. Yes, that's just a taste of the after party. So make sure you check us out after this. Now, let's get to our wide receivers. This is something we typically do in the offseason here on the preview. We preview one position, and we're going to go to the wide receivers today, and we're going to break down the players that are on the roster. And we're going to kind of give a general synopsis of what might happen this offseason, who might stay, who might go, who might step up, who might take a step backwards. So, Dave, do you have the depth chart there? 
You said you were going to get the depth chart. I said I was pulling up the the um I think I got it in my brain though cuz I I brought up Yeah, the I was say, we could probably though. piece. We could probably piece. We've got there. We've got Juju Smith-Schuster. We've yes, got sir. we've got my favorite player of all time, Deontay Johnson. We've got, got we've got James Washington. Yep. We've got Deion Kane. Mhm. We've got Ryan Switzer. Bingo. We've we've got Johnny Holton. Oh, he's the best. Yes, and we've got let's let's um um Dharma was it Dharma Arbo how do you say it Arma Dar Darbo <laughs> I got it all mixed up Arma I thought you were gonna say Amara I thought you were gonna say, you were gonna say you. I thought you were gonna say Dharma and Greg or something I remember that Dharma show. and Greg <laughs> <laughs> we are already at after party mode <laughs> anyway um, you're leaving so, out you're leaving out Jamal was, Custis. No, no, that well, one. No. I, I know. He hasn't gotten the, the futures, futures guys, guys yet. yet. Oh, because the futures guys are Jamal Custis and Quadri Henderson and Anthony Johnson. Um, that must have been a signing that wasn't one of the original signings, but that sounds familiar. So I'm going to say you were probably correct. All right. So to expedite the process a little bit, are we assuming that any of the players that we can't pronounce their names or are on reserves contract are not going to make the 2020 roster? You, talk, you mean, are you talking about the dash guys? Well, yeah. Is there anyone that you see on that list that you're like, yeah, I could see him maybe making the team in some way, shape or form. Anyone. Um, Quadri Henderson as a return man. I don't know. That's the only thing I can think of. I like, I mean, but I kind of like Deontay Johnson back there for now, but like you say, well, he was a second team all he, pro in that position. as he gets, as he gets to be a better receiver, you'd won't want to put him back there. Um, and when it came to kickoffs, if they're going to keep Kareth White around, I thought he did fine and has the speed burst for the kickoffs. So I don't know about someone coming in just as a returner. Um, the answer, I, can I, be I, th I think Kane's going to stick around. <laughs> so yeah, Kane should. Yeah. Well, no, he's not a futures guy. He's I know. Not, yeah. he, he's, I wouldn't even say he's a dash guy. People know Dion yeah. Kane in Pittsburgh now. Yeah. So let's get into the Brian. Was there anyone that you would say? out of the guys that are a little bit more irrelevant. Yeah. I'm thinking Amara Darbo. What, what attracts you about Amara? What, what is it? Amarla, Amarla Dar? What? Amara Darbo. He was okay. on the active roster at the end of last year. He just was never active. So sorry. He was on the active. He was in the 53 man roster. He was just never active on game day. There we go. Okay. All right. So let's get to the top, top six. And say, because they typically keep six wide receivers, right, Dave? You do that uh, all? Yes. All right. So Juju's a lock. Deontay Johnson's a lock. James Washington is a lock. And then nothing after that, in my opinion, is certain. Johnny Holton is a lock. Oh, gosh. I don't know. Yeah, I, I don't is. know. Because I mean, because they've, they, they Jones for these, they love DHB. They love Darius Hayward Bay. They love this. They love Johnny Holton. They want that specific guy to be an emergency wide receiver and your gunner and your, your special teams guy. They love him. So I think he's a lock. Okay. Dave, do you agree? Well, the only way that changes, because honestly, he does not give you anything as a receiver. I no. mean, and they put him out there on the field on a play that they knew they were running. And I'm like, it, it didn't even, that's what made you knew a hundred percent. It was going to, you know, 72 was eligible. Johnny Holton was the only receiver. Come on. They're going to, they're going to run the ball. So, Oh, let's try to throw him off and we'll go sneak James Washington out there. And then we'll throw Well, duh. Of course you're going to throw it when you put someone else out there. You got to put him out there all the time. Anyway, uh, let's get away from that. The only way that happens is if you have another player that is a great gunner, because they have another one now. They have another one because he beat out Artie Burns. For Justin their Lane. Spot, and that's Justin Lane. If you get another gunner that, let's say, just comes out of nowhere in training camp, then you don't have to use wide receiver for that. So I, would, I wouldn't say he's a lock, but I would say until someone else emerges as a gunner and not a wide receiver, um, then, then they're probably going to keep him. Okay, so then that's four. There's two spots left. The question now is who claims the last two spots? But before we get to that is, do they address wide receiver in the draft? Brian, we'll start with you. I think they do. It's probably a fourth round draft pick. It's something like that. They'll, they'll probably look at that, but not early. 
They're, they they have too much stuff to do early. You have an edge rusher, no matter what happens with with Bud Dupree. You have a lineman you have to get, and you uh, you're probably looking at getting a tight end, regardless of what happens as well. They want to get a running back. They might even get a running back relatively early. Um, so y- you know, I think it's down the line, but maybe uh, possibly a fourth at the earliest, but maybe a sixth or a seventh. They they probably address it, but. I, I don't think it's uh, going to be a, a a big prospect. Dave, what are your thoughts? Um, it all comes down to Ben Roethlisberger and how bad he wants Ryan Switzer. Because if Ben Roethlisberger wants Ryan Switzer, I think they're going to keep Deion Kane, and therefore their best bet would be to not draft a wide receiver until fifth or later and then hope that they can have them on the practice squad for a year. Because, But, I mean – some people are still thinking you get that prolific guy in the second round and he's he falls to you, you take him, then you're gonna then you're gonna be making Ben mad. They have kept seven wide receivers of it, you know, in the past. They they have, but it's kind of pushing it. You want to know my theory? Here's what I think is gonna happen. They're gonna take a wide receiver in the second round, if not the second, the third. They're looking for one of the dynamic. This is a deep wide receiver class. That's Some true. are saying this is one of the best wide receiver classes in the last decade in terms of depth and quality of player. They want another playmaker because they think it'll just really help round out the offense, especially if Ben's healthy. So then you're saying, okay, well, who's going to go? I think the Dion Kane, if he can prove that he's a gunner, will make Johnny Holton expendable. Okay. And they I can, can get rid it. of him. Okay. Yeah, I, I could see because that. Because Justin Lane, like you said, is the proven gunner. I could see Deion Kane saying, look, I'll do whatever it takes to make this team. If it means run down on special teams and tackle, I'll do it. And if he's, I think he's just as fast probably. And he, we know he offers more as a receiver. Then yes. you can cut Johnny Holton and you can live with it. So I can live I, with that option. And I, and Brian Switzer's probably going to be back. <laughs> yeah. I mean, Ben wants what he gets. He gets what he yeah. wants. You're right. And and there you go. I mean, there comes to a point when it's like, yeah, I know he's your guy, but you know, we're thinking about more than that, more than what you want there, pal. Yeah, but I think that the quarterback should have some say into who he's throwing the football to, but he shouldn't have the ultimate say. You know, he shouldn't it's, be the and then again, we also don't know if he does have the ultimate say. Well, it it should be because he's it, it should be because he's a good player and could help the Steelers not because he's a guy that you like to go hang out at basketball games with you could you know tether, what I'm saying you can tether Dave Schofield and Brian Anthony Davis together and we would have more yards after catch than Ryan Switzer <laughs> <laughs> yeah you guys would be yak machines you'd be a yak <laughs> machine to, to put you all together so you know if it comes down to six players I think that's the assumption is that they're going to keep six and and it's going to be a position to watch Throughout the offseason, especially throughout free agency and the draft, there's nothing to say that they won't go and look for a veteran wide receiver. Although I think Dante Moncrief might have soured them on that. Um, Brian would know more than anyone. I think you're starting to work on your wide receiver article in terms of who's out there, if there's anyone that's attractive that might fit their price range, which is basically nothing. Brian, It's ready for tomorrow, actually. <laughs> it, uh, it will be debuting tomorrow. It's in the queue, so it's coming. So, you, you know, the, the top five that you're looking at, number one, I mean, not a chance. It's uh, Amari Cooper, of course. Yeah, you know, no. he, So a lot of the guys in the top five. The one guy that I thought would have been a great option, and he signed with the Lions, back with the Lions on Monday, was Danny Amendola. Uh, would have actually been a really good option for what he's done last year and what he's done in the last few years, but he went back to Detroit. That was the guy that I was really looking at. The other ones you're looking at are like Robbie Anderson, a lot of character issues there in the top five. I mean, there's there's more guys down the road a little bit that, uh, that haven't had, uh, that aren't big names, but you could probably bring a cheap option like that in. I like what Ali says in the live chat. He said, if Dante Moncrief can make a roster after this year, Dave and Brian can. I agree with that. <laughs> and then I also agree with Sean Manahan. He says, Dave could be our kicker. <laughs> well, I don't know. I've seen him kick. I'm not, sure. I'm not sure if we want that. But, hey, if Dave's at a game and they're in a pinch, I mean, he's already wearing Cam Hayward's jersey. You could probably just say, hey, give him mm-hmm. Cam's helmet. Just throw it. Fit right in. No one will know. No one will know. 
All right. I can I can Trivia hit an extra point. Yeah, you could. You could. Well, oh, what the, the extended extra point? I don't know. Yeah. Oh, that's thirty. We need, yards. we need to do. We need to do this again. <laughs> you saw me hit the thirty-five yarder. It wasn't on oh, yeah. film. I don't know. I, I kind of lost track. I mean, I don't know. I, I lose. No, and yeah. I don't know that I could hit it every time. And that's what you have to do. <laughs> All right. Ten now, years ago. He, he hit it. He hit it. I'm just joking. Let's get to some trivia. Time for me to put on my dunce right. cap and look like an idiot compared to Brian and Dave. So, Dave, the Oracle, as Lance Williams, or I'm sorry, Sir Lancelot calls you. Why don't you go ahead and give us, give us what you got? Okay. Well, um, I got some interesting stuff here. I was looking at wide receiver stuff, of course. Same here. I have some wide um, receivers. And just thought I'd look at stuff. I know Jeff likes to talk about, you know, maybe some that were, you know, where they were drafted or anything else. I decided I was going to look at catch percentage. Ooh. Meaning, now this has been, this only, like if you're using a pro football reference, uh, this has only been a statistic that they use since 1992. Because it's basically receptions, divided by targets. Um, so if a player was targeted, how many receptions they had off of it? So I went in and I said, okay, well, let's look at how the Steelers have done since 1992 and who has and who has the best. And I said, well, you can't just do it because some guys, you know, it, you know who it could be? It would be Zach Gentry who caught yeah, one pass one for catch, four yeah. yards on one target in his I actually so looked far. at those stats, by the way. I looked okay. at that. that so uh -oh, and so you, might, you might know this. I went with I went with 50 if they've had not 50 catches but 50 targets. Okay. And I said who has the highest catch percentage since 1992 for the Steelers? And it was 50 targets more. And I'll be honest with you, I dropped all the way down to 10 targets and it was still the same player. They have an 8 don't don't look it up Brian. Okay, that, that they have I'm an not. 80% catch I wouldn't even rate know where to for start. the Steelers. I'll I'm so, going to say it is a wide receiver though. Okay, it could be a wide receiver or a tight end. I did both okay. of them. I didn't do All running right. backs. No okay. running backs. Didn't count Got that. It. I'm going to go with Heath Miller. Okay. The That's my guess. Percentage. Heath, when I think of Heath Miller, I don't think of him dropping a lot of passes. Mm -hmm. Well, I, you also have to remember, because this also includes what if the quarterback is throwing the ball away and throwing it at your feet? You know what I'm saying? To where you couldn't really catch it or anything like a, that. Mm, it's okay. technically that's, a I'm target. With my guess. I'm just reminding uh, you. I get okay. it. I get it. All right, Dave Brian? or Brian, who would your guess? Maybe with Charles Johnson. Are you ready? Because it is with an 80 percent catch rate, 80 percent, 44 receptions on 55 targets. For I'm pretty sure it's 285 yards or around there, and one career touchdown. Your best catching wide receiver in Steelers history is one Ryan Switzer. Oh my gosh! <laughs> <sighs> yeah, all right, here's a question. You guys, wait, you guys, wait, 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 wait! I'm not done. I'm not done. I'm not done. All right. Because all right, what's crazy is when you're doing it 50 targets or more. He has he has the highest catch percentage, but he has the second lowest yards per target. The only person who has lower yards per target was uh, would be Mark Bruner. <laughs> nice. So, nice. So, because, yeah, he's only targeted for 5.09. He only has 5.09 yards per target. So that was kind of bad. But do you guys want to know out of 50, out of 50 um, targets or more, who has the lowest pat, uh, catch percentage? Since Dante Moncrief. <laughs> He didn't get 50 targets or he'd have been, he'd have been close. Uh, Lima Swede. Oh, that's it. I don't know. Did he ever, did he even get 50 targets? Cause he was so bad. He played I don't know. For what? Three seasons. Um, Sammy okay. Coates. There's your answer. It's Sammy yes. Coates. <laughs> <laughs> it's Sammy Coates. So there you go. Highest, highest catch percentage of in the Steelers. You 50. said, you said Switzer's has one touchdown, right? One touchdown. It was Who like did he a, scored the touchdown against. I remember it was, uh, it was, they were on the one, was it the one or two yard line? And it was a little out and he was yeah. barely in the end zone because he didn't throw the ball down the field. Uh, Again? I'm, I'm, Brian, you should know this. Is that the he did Switzer, Switzer's only touchdown was against? I was going to say. The Jacksonville Jaguars? I was going to say the Cincinnati Bengals. Oh, was it? I'm, oh, no. The, my, he, was the, knocked, he was knocked knocked. Uh, knocked around and uh, interfered with against Jacksonville. That's what I was thinking of. Uh, gosh, I, I don't remember. Ryan Kellerman's got it. Tampa. 
It was the Monday night game, I believe. Was that that Monday night game? Yeah, okay. Yeah, it, yeah, it, it was. It, the the yeah. animal game. And it was where he caught yeah. it going out of bounds, and he had it. Was, it was actually a good. It was a good play. Yeah, it was, it was good a good design. play. Out route, yeah. Mm-hmm. There you go. Brian Anthony Davis's son is in the live chat. Welcome, Connor. Thank you for joining us. He said, "Hello, <laughs> Dad." <laughs> you know what he was? <laughs> oh, there, there he is. Oh, hi, Bad. He's <laughs> calling me Bad. They, I was looking at the uh, the YouTube comments the other day because Jeff always says, "Don't look at the YouTube comments." So yeah, it was after my it. solo show. So I looked, and the first thing I see is like that Brian guy is my dad. And I looked, at it, I was like, "Yeah, there's... <laughs> okay." At, at least my sons. I'm like, "Hey, so you listen to the show?" He goes, "No." <laughs> just so we got Brian's son. My uh-huh. my mom has been in the live chat. Lance's mom has been in the live chat. Dave, where's... well, Dave does a show with his brother. It's a family and affair then, here. And then his son's here. in the live chat. My other nephew sometimes is in the live chat i've had my daughter on the show that's true it's a family Mm. affair (laughs) yeah all right the worst segment ever (laughs) (laughs) all right so for my trivia i i just looked up some stats as well and i was just stunned by some of the names uh in terms of career statistics and i looked at receiving yards per game i think that most of you would be able to guess who leads that category for the pittsburgh steelers right probably ab Oh, per game, I would say. Receiving yeah. yards per game, yes. Gotta be Antonio AD. Brown at 86.2, and that was from 2010 to 2018, 130 games. The question is, do you know who's second? Yards an, per game. This is an reception, receiving yards per game. This is a old-time player, played in 66 games, Mario Lemieux, um, from 1959 to 1963. He averaged 71.6 receiving yards per game. OB Nickel? No. Buddy Dial? You got it. Buddy Dial, 71.6 receiving yards, 66 games. Sorry, now, here's Dave. what's crazy. <laughs> I stepped oh, no, on you. No, 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 you're fine. He, the biggest thing was, what I was surprised with, was who's third in receiving yards per game, 68.9 yards per game, only played in 42 games and is a current player on the team. I was going to say Juju has got to be there Juju because of the long. would be correct. Juju yeah. Smith-Schuster wow. with 68.9. Now, here is another interesting stat, and this is the last one for me. I then looked at receptions per game. Clearly, Antonio Brown would be first at 6.4. There's a tie for second. Who do you think those two are? And they're both modern-era players. Now, this They're is just receivers or tight ends? Reception. Well. Uh, well, this would be, well, I don't want to give it away, but there might be another position. Okay, so it could be like a running back. Um, receptions per game. I'm going to say that that uh, Mr. Budnicki Giraud might be up there with how many receptions he, he's got. He is one of the two, yes. Okay. At five receptions per game. Five Can we think of the other one? Brian, I already got one. I was going to let you... We know it's five because they're tied for second. I mean, Heath comes to mind, but I'm sure it's not that. Um, he, no, he had too many games where he only had like two receptions. Mike Wallace. Juju See, Smith-Schuster. Was it Juju? Mm-hmm. Yeah, because- Juju and Le'Veon Bell tied at five mm-hmm. receptions per game on average. I just was stunned that Le'Veon Bell had five per game uh, <laughs> in an I'm, average. I mean, I know he didn't I mean, play as long as Antonio Brown, but still. But but look at the number of games where he had like ten receptions, yeah. Because they were just constantly just flaring it out to him, yeah. Which is basically like a run play, because they're throwing it to him behind the line of scrimmage. My good old buddy Dial, seventy one point six yards per game. And then my next guest was Gary Ballman because those are the three <laughs> old guys that I could, uh, the old guys <laughs> that I can think of: Ray Matthews, Gary Ballman. All right, that's it for me. Bad, go ahead. All right, so um. I hope there's not any holes in this question, but who was the last single season receiving leader, wide receiver, to not be drafted by the Pittsburgh Steelers? Okay, so you said who's the last person, well, wide receiver or just in general? Wide receiver. Wide receiver for the Steelers, but wasn't for drafted the Steelers, by the Steelers to lead the team in receiving yards, receptions. And he was not drafted by the Steelers. Hmm. I know Cotry led the team in touchdowns, nah, he but didn't he didn't lead, lead in, re- in receiving yards. I'm um, thinking this has to go back a ways. Um, was he? Uh, I don't think did they draft Yancey Thigpen? Not unless they were the San Diego Chargers. 
So is it Yancey Thigpen? It's, it is that, Yancey that, that, Great. Great. My guy. Great uh, that was one of my favorite players. Great job, Jeff. Thank you. I yeah. just did. I kept on thinking about all the play. I mean, the Steelers draft wide receivers well. They always have. And uh, that's a good question. That was a good one. Great uh, middle name, too. I was going to say. By the way. What, what is it? Yancey Dirk Thigpen. <laughs> Dirk. <laughs> How did you go from Yancey to Dirk? Dirk yeah, Yancey um, Dirk. <laughs> um, I, I, I can throw out one more to you guys. Sure. Since 1992, there is only one. This is wide receivers tight end. Like I said, I didn't, I didn't include running backs. One player on the Steelers that has an a, a two-thirds catch percentage, meaning 66.7%, and nine yards per target. Could you say that again? That he has he has at least nine yards per target and cat and has catched catched <laughs> caught at least two thirds of his of his targets. Hmm. I don't know, Brian. Any guesses? So since nineteen ninety two. Since nineteen ninety two, only one Steeler has that where they've caught more than 66.7% of their targets and has at least nine yards per target. So they need to catch the ball well and Basically get a lot they of yards. can't be Rosie it. Nicks. Um, uh, no. Uh, I would probably think, uh, well, let's just go with, uh, hmm, Mark Bruner. No, we're, we're going with Juju. <laughs> okay. Juju I can't finishes. believe oh can't Juju believe all the time. All these, all I mean, because yeah, he's I mean, he's really got he's got nine nine point one nine yards per per target, not per reception per target, but that goes up when you catch a lot more of your targets because you got someone like like Mike Wallace is over ten. He had yeah. he's crazy, but the problem was his catch percentage was under sixty. Yeah. So. But but he would like he's the answer. Any anytime you're doing Steelers trivia and you want to know about like um, yards per catch or yards per, it's going to be Mike Wallace. That's who it's going to be because he, you know, how many times did he have? Oh, uh, uh, 136 yards uh, on three completions and two touchdowns. You know what I mean? That's yeah. the kind of game that he had. One okay, quick, coming. ten more juju facts. Come on, okay. let's go. <laughs> all ju- W-J-U-J-U, all juju all the time. That's right. All right, so that wraps up the Steelers preview. We hope that you, if you're watching live on YouTube, join us for the after party, which will be happening within five minutes of the ending of this show. But if you're listening on audio platform, when this show publishes, which will be tonight or tomorrow morning, the after party will not publish until about 1 p.m. Eastern time. It gives you something to listen to on your way home. On Friday, it'll be lighthearted, be fun. Join us there, guys. Thanks for your time. We'll see you at the after party. Check it out.